I never thought I'd say this, but this has been an incredible experience. Um, it was a scary one and a daunting one. I'd never even heard of Coursera um, when I got the invitation from the provost and my dean. Um, and so went online, and at the time they only had, I think, 33 partners or 16. It was very small when we joined on. And there was one nutrition course taught. And so I wanted to design a course a little different than what was out there um, already. So I tried to do a little different focus. Um, the invitation said adapt one of your existing courses. It was an uh, entirely different venture than just adapting your course. Um, but but it's, it's been a, a great experience. Um, I never knew, well I did know, but I really learned more about nutrition. <laughs> it's not just a science, but a passion for many people. Um, my discussion board was wild and crazy, and GMOs and food additives and all these hot topics, you know. Um, and I, of course, I finished my f filming in like March, um, and we went live in early May. And um, you can't go back and change what you say. So I knew when my video was coming on GMOs, I was going to get slammed by some of these students. <laughs> but, but we've managed, and we walked through it, and um, you know, it, it's been a great experience. But Cynthia had asked me to share a little bit about course planning, and of course, as we talked, and even Derek talked, all these things kept coming into my mind. One thing I want to just say is that it has been an incredibly valuable part of this experience is getting to work with and get to know the other faculty members and support staff in this. We met every other week as a team, um, and the faculty that were teaching, the support staff, Center for Teaching, Cynthia, um, a librarian, we all came together whenever we could. And that meeting served to kind of keep us on task, uh, gave us some accountability. It also gave a forum to learn about the vision and how we fit into it and what Vanderbilt was doing. But it also gave um, an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and as Dave and Doug's course launched, you know, I was able to garnish some of their wisdom and, and also avoid some of the issues um, that we kind of learned that came up um, along the way. So. I, you know, that team meeting was great for, you know, just support, morale, information, and all that. So I would definitely encourage that. Um, and Derek spoke to several of these things, but of course, when I went to design my course, um, I was asked on a Friday, and we had to have something up on Tuesday night, um, a course description. So uh, in essence, your syllabus. So that was a quick turnaround, which is a good and bad thing, working under a tight deadline. Um, so I kind of planned out a course at that point. So in doing so, I sort of had, you know, my objectives in line, uh, which kind of mimicked some of the ones in my course. Um, and then it just seemed like this huge project that I didn't know what to do with or where to really jump in and get started. So one thing, um, oh, I'll show this in a minute. But um, one thing I had wanted to, that Cynthia had asked me to share with you, um, it's a word document. And I have, of course, changed this a lot since this time. Um, whoop. Sorry. Where did that go? There it is. All right. There we go. Um, was I put together my own planning log, and it's about 10 pages long, I guess, um, for the total length of it. But what I did was I, I sat down and made myself a little table um, to try to get a handle on this because you, you teach when you learn about Coursera, as I know many of you did, you don't get up and give a 75 minute lecture or a two hour lecture straight. Um, that it's these segments that are anywhere from say, my shortest or maybe five or six minutes, which are really more introductory ones, up to 20 minutes is the longest. Um, most average probably around 12 minutes. So I had to take what I taught and figure out how to break it up uh, into manageable, sensible segments um, that worked, you know, that I could give kind of a title to and then move to the next one. Also design um, questions around and do all those things. So I found this helpful for me was I just kind of gave out the session, um, what the segments were going to be, and we were shooting for about two hours worth of video a week. So considering that helped me decide how many segments I needed. I think we lettered them since the weeks were numbered. I think the highest we went up to was K. And it also was the videographers. Week one video, you know, week one A, week one C. Um, and then um, 
kind of what I was going to cover in those segments, what some ideas were for the video, because I didn't want to just stand there and lecture, so I had props in mind. I also um, did some other things. I interviewed people in two different segments, one on plant-based diets. I interviewed a vegan, um, interviewed a physician on food allergies. Um, I interviewed um, we had an incredible segment the first week with an author of a book called Hungry Planet, Peter Menzel, and we did a Skype audio with him and then just showed his pictures. Um, we also did, which this one didn't go over great, <laughs> I did an interview with uh, a, a VP for a food company that produces functional foods. Uh, and he talked about functional food marketing and, you know, I asked him questions. But he had all the food products around him on the Skype. And people said they felt like they were watching an infomercial, so I had to go back and make that optional because I didn't want people to feel like I was trying to sell them something. Um, and then I thought about what the assignments and assessments would be for that week, and then just, you know, what I kind of needed to do. Um, and so, you know, I did this initially for all uh, seven weeks. Um, and, you know, changed it, of course, some along the way. But it really gave me something to start working with, and it also helped me identify my next steps. Uh, and I worked through it week for week. One tip, we filmed week two first because it was a new experience. And we didn't want our first attempt to be the first thing students saw. So we actually filmed our week two as our first set of videos. And we did learn during week two. So when we, we went back to film week one, we didn't want to lose students right off, you know, when they went into week one. Um, but, but this really kind of helped me. Um, I know everyone else plans a little differently, but it, it helped for me to have kind of a plan and an idea. Um, I wanted to... With the assignments, I opted not to do peer grading in part because of the, you know, the level of my course. It's a, a, a 200 level here at Vanderbilt, inter undergrad course, nutrition, and, you know, they were analyzing their own diets and doing things. It was kind of a personal thing, too, to put it out there for peer review. So I gave credit for submission of those assignments. So Coursera just gave credit. It was only like 5% of your course grade for each assignment. The quizzes were the bulk of 10% each week. Um, I also did a pre and post like dietary assessment tool to see if students change their eating habits over the course from the first week to the last. What I found was the majority of my students already were doing a lot. Um, the people that opt to take a nutrition course already had an interest and already I had my vegans and my raw foodist and my paleos and my, you know, <laughs> all over the place people in that course. Um, in terms of uh, images, like Derek, that was a nightmare because I used my own slides and kind of built from there, added, took away. But I had Googled imaged blueberries or, you know, I'd Googled imaged everything. And so it was like pulling all those out. And fortunately, we have a... Um, graphic designer in our school, in the School of Nursing, who was a great help, who helped me also find, you know, images, and he found many of them, um, that that was, that was definitely a huge help. Um, in terms of the not peer grading, I did start a thread every week on the discussion board to ask for feedback from their assignment, like they evaluated a dietary supplement using some medical literature and some, you know, creditable websites. And I asked them to talk about that, and people did. And for the food labeling assignment, um, like Derek mentioned, because I had U.S. and non-U.S. students, that came out the lot. The first week I had complaints saying it was too U.S.-centric, um, because that's my context. Um, I did include a segment the first week on international food guides and Peter Menzel's videos showed around the world. But, you know, that was, that was a challenge, pulling all that in. And I, I know that's not really the, the concept uh, context for today, but I did have students, for the U.S. students, they pretended they were on an FDA subcommittee and giving recommendations for changing food labels and what they would advise, and my non-U.S. were to talk about how their labels differed from U.S. labels and what kind of recommendations, and to post a picture. We had almost 300 um, posts of food labels from around the world. It's, it was amazing to see these, um, just, you know, and so that was a really exciting thread to follow. Um, 
some were not so exciting to follow. But, um, oh, another tip, and this is, I was the only female of the group for this first go-round. I wore the same outfit <laughs> for each week. So, like, for week one, you know, I was like the turtleneck queen for the first few weeks. I'd wear, you know, like a red turtleneck and a scarf. And, you know, um, and it was in part to keep consistency, so it seemed like it was the same week. Um, and it also helped my videographers because they knew what week it was when they were looking and editing the segments. They laughed because one day I came in and I had different earrings than the outfit. So, you know, it was like find Waldo kind of thing that I, I changed. But, um, but that, was, that was helpful for me. I don't know if, if Doug and, and Dave did something like that. Yeah, you did too. It, it helps the videographers. It also helps it seem... Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> you watch for that. I know we're going to edit one of the sessions, and I'm going to have to replicate <laughs> what I had on, you know. Um, so it was, um, but I wanted, let's see, a couple of other things. Um, we used a green screen um, and then did a background with that. The, the videographers um, and the graphic designers did that. And in some things, we actually had moving stuff behind us. You know, they actually inserted video instead of pictures, um, which made it kind of interesting, too. And in one thing, my videographer had me, like, reach over and take a supplement bottle from him. And then he put, like, a, a shelf, so it looked like I was actually <laughs> We were going to go out and do actual kind of outside things, but it just got too much. Um, let's see. What else did I write down? Um, you can give credits for post in the discussion board as part of the, the course grade, which if you want your students to get involved in discussions, um, you can do that. Two minutes? Okay. Let me show you one quick thing. Um, that is this little goodie. I think that's on our website, isn't it, Derek? The, the little planning thing, if they are interested in that. I did want to show you this just because this helped me. I didn't learn this the first week. I did this the second week. Um, the white slides are talk over slides. Oh, go back, come back. Okay. Um, well, you can kind of see. What these are, it, the blue slides are what the students will see. And these were rough because we hadn't added all the new images in. Um, but what I would do was, for example, and I'll. I'll hurry here. The first week I just had my own slides and I found I was frozen in front of the camera and would read my own slides and it didn't feel, you know, so different than teaching in a classroom. So the next week I wrote myself a little promo and a little closing because my videographer said, uh, don't you think you should wrap it up instead of just stopping, you know? So I had to come up with like a little intro to a segment and then a closing. And I actually did those just in a different color slide and used, it, used my um, slide almost as a teleprompter. Uh, and I held the, the clicker. And sometimes I said, talk over picture of X. And it would have the white slide. And then it would go into you know, this with whatever the segment had, um, talk over. And um, then I'd say, segment B. And just kind of, and it also helped my videographers because you have to give them your slides. It helped them know which segments were which. Um, and so that was real helpful to me was to, to do that. It took a little more work, but uh, I think it made it smoother in front of the camera. Um, and, it, and the beauty of editing, you know, that you can go, I didn't say that right. Let me say it again. And, you know, they work magic with editing. So I will stop there because... Um, I know. Yes. Thank you. And I think we'll have time for questions after we all. Okay. Ask for one or two while I set up. Sure. Okay. Yeah, well. Oh. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry, I was trying to figure out how to. What format and how are you going to distribute the book? Well, oh, he asked about the book. Well, my current textbook was Nutrition Now, but from Cengage. Um, 
and I just gave it as a link. You can't, of course, have any cross wall for the format we did. So it was just like, this is the textbook I use. It's not required. I gave lots of links to websites, um, both within the, and because they can't click on the video, we had to pull those all out and we made them available separately. We made a week page for each week where they could go directly to lectures and then we said segment A and these were the links that were within segment A, segment B, um, so that they could use, you know, the links that we provided. Now, um, my book won't come out till like 2015. So, it, we may still be running it. But, you know, now there's so many things I want to change about this last offering. It's print. It may be e more ebook by then, but um, but Cengage is working with us, and they're going to make some chapters available for the next rendering um, or the next offering. Um, so th just the chapters associated with the topics, they'll have those in PDF. But we didn't we didn't have that available this time. I know some students bought it because they talked about how expensive it was. <laughs> um, so you know it, they are. Yes. We don't know quite yet. Okay. Um, Cynthia, do you have any sense? Have you looked at the numbers? Uh, I couldn't get into that. Okay. Well, ultimately, we had like 85,000 that somehow clicked on it or something. About half that were active at the beginning, and we don't know yet. And if you read, I would ask Ryan that question, and he said it depends on what numbers you use. If you use just the ones that, like in a passing interest, clicked on it, or the ones that actually participated and which percentage of those finished. And we haven't looked at the final numbers on who got certificates um, and who didn't. So we don't know yet. Because that's a major issue. Oh, yes. Yes. Because the attrition rates are high. Yes. Okay, my name is Dave Owens. I taught a course uh, called Strategic Innovation Organizations. A couple of things were mentioned. I'm probably going to repeat a number of things that were said, and so uh, there's information there. Like the more we repeat it, the more we were traumatized by it. <laughs> and so I think it's worth uh, <laughs> worth understanding. I just I don't know if the sound will work, but I just wanted to give you a sense of of my videos. This is the first one. It has the logo, right? Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say I'm kind of stupid. I was kind of stupid for volunteering to do this and doing it in this way. I'm still stupid. Um, <laughs> but it was uh, be, because I, I, I'm, like, I'm like, a, uh, like an obsessive learner. Like I had to learn how to do this. And so I had to go buy a camera and I had to video it myself and I had to buy video editing software and I had to do all this stuff. Even though I was teaching and I was trying to write and I was trying to do everything else um, at the same time. But uh, let me just show you. Yeah, it's on. I wrote music for the little intros. <laughs> video that I did where I talk about the syllabus, I talk about the deliverables, talk about the expectations, all Okay, so imagine 30 hours of that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because the, I was going to, you know, I wanted to use music and, I, and you can't use anything copyrighted. I wanted to use images and you can't use anything copyrighted. I have a class in innovation. I'm a visual learner myself and so I had all kinds of pictures and things in there. I was working with my um, TA and he was trying to learn the video editing software. I said, dude, move over, let me do it. And so while I was doing it, I noticed that he was doodling on the side, and it turns out he's a really good artist. And I said, you, you know how to draw? He said, yeah, I'm an illustrator. I'm like, dude, what are you, like? So I made him stop. He was not, not allowed to touch a computer. Had to, to draw the whole time. He must have drawn about uh, 400, 500 images uh, for the course, and was into it. And he just, he just got really, really good at it. There were certain characters, and lots of Doctor Who references, and sort of, you know, he's like a pr pretty nerdy guy. Um, <laughs> not like me, not like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to talk about a couple things. I, I feel like I, as, as I was listening, I kept thinking, oh, I should talk about that, I should talk about that, but I'll just stick to my, uh, uh, what, what I intended to talk about. And there were some really interesting issues in, in online course navigation, and, and some of them were um, potentially predictable, but some not. So I just wanted to go into it, talk about some conceptual model things that I realized that my conceptual model was different than the one that the students um, brought to the uh, experience. I want to talk about, uh, and some of the resulting um, 
issues around flows through the material and how that worked. Uh, also, the discussion forums were a, a really interesting thing. I think they're immensely valuable and also uh, worth thinking th a few thoughts uh, before you sort of uh, dive into that. Then also course tracks, and that may be a little bit less of an issue here for you all um, in the four, four um, credit courses, but maybe not, and you can see if this is, is meaningful to you. So let me just talk about the course overview just, uh, um, just conceptually. Uh, it's an eight-week course. It is a course I teach in a face-to-face -face, uh, program. It's a fairly mature course. I've been teaching it for about 12, 13 years. Um, it's a course I, I created. It's, it's, it's um, let's see. Uh, in, our, in the business school, we work in mods, so we can work in eight-week chunks, and so I really just took the class just straight over. I also wrote a book based on the class. It had eight chapters, just the same way we had eight sessions here. Um, and so what, what I do is I start the week one, and there's a course framework, and so the course is about innovation, and basically what I'm trying to do is show people that when we use the term innovation, people um, have sort of lay models of what innovation is and how innovation works, and I show them how their model can actually be based in one of the academic disciplines. And so there's a psychology perspective on innovation, they call it creativity, it's about what happens in the head. There's a social psychology perspective on innovation, it's about group process and how groups work. And uh, so on, organizational behavior, economics have one, everyone has one. And by the way, they don't like each other, right? We don't talk to each other, we don't, uh, right? And so people will have one perspective, but they won't have the others. And so the idea of the course is to say, hey, look, there's multiple ways of looking at this, and so you want to take the perspective that gives you the most power, the most explanatory power. So I'm in a professional school, and we have people who are you're trying to actually use this stuff. And so I say, you know, if you have a psychological problem, do not use the, the economic perspective to try to solve that. You really need to think about it from an... Uh, Okay, so that's how it works, and at the end I sort of put it together and show you how to diagnose, that is how to figure out which of these perspectives will give you that power to be able to explain what's going on in a um, situation. So each week, so, so basically each of these six here are parallel, and so they all go in parallel, they all start with a story, and they have, they have a, um, uh, uh, um, just a logic to them, which is, looks basically like this. So each week you have lecture videos, and they have embedded quizzes, at the end of the week there's a quiz, there's a diagnostic survey. It's a little survey they take that tells them uh, to what extent they may, may um, I, I do this in terms of constraints and sort of what stops innovation, so to what extent that they may suffer from a constraint at that level. Um, there are peer assessed assignments, so there were reflection essays, so they had to write a reflection essay. They had to do a project assignment, potentially, and then there was a class discussion form. So each week they just basically took one of each of these things. And so they would go through that six times. Intro, six times through this, and then wrap up, and we're done, we're out of there. I had intended to do these different course tracks, so there was an, uh, intended to have an audit track where I took a couple of online courses before I taught this one, and I felt immensely guilty all the time, because I would never do the homework. And it was like, oh, you know, I want to go watch it again, and I felt guilty because an email would come through how I hadn't done the homework, and, and so I thought, I'll do this, an audit track, because that would have made me feel okay about it, and this is, about, this is not about you know, credit, this really is about ex expanding outreach. So it's gonna have an audit track, watch videos, take embedded videos, a standard track, audit plus these individual deliverables, and then also have a project track for some people who wanted to do a project or a project with the team. And so I saw multiple levels of engagement, different ways, the different things that people might want to get out of it, and so they could work on it um, uh, through those. So the first problem I had was what I'm going to call basically, you know, the first click confusion. I put together what made sense to me, and I started getting all kinds of, huh, it's hard to know what, what, what all kinds means, but you have some users who are sort of fairly um, vociferous and also are um, thought leaders for others. And so other people don't know what to think, but they, if they feel confused, they can make other people feel confused, even though they might not have been confused uh, <laughs> to start. I mean, yeah. I had one guy the whole time, he was saying, I vote that Owen starts the course over. It was like the fifth week. I was like, I vote that Owen starts. So I, I basically had to send him a, a side email, like, dude, like, that's not cool. So, uh, okay. Um, so, so some of the things that I saw, is, it goes off a little bit here, but I, I looked at a couple of courses and courses that I had sort of not taken, uh, done the homework on, and saw all these sort of big menus of like, okay, what do I do first? Where, where do I go in? What do I do first? And so I'm thinking, okay, I'll make it easy for people um, because there are just too many menu items. This is a different course. So I thought, well, in the main menu, I'll put, here's a link to the sessions and then week one session and then the task one, task two, task three. Just make perfect sense. Um, so I had a, up here, these three things, course sessions. And this is about the course. And then if you clicked on that, it would take you to these week one, week two, week three. And if you clicked on that, it would take you to the page that had all those things. Well, 
I don't know why and, and what those pages would look like. So if I clicked from here, it would take me to something like this, part one of learning activities overview, part one, uh, and part two graded activities. So what I have to learn and what, what gets graded. The first problem was that people really didn't think that this was appropriate. They thought that the weeks should be in that main menu. And it was, it was like, well, because in Blackboard, I, I, would do, I did it this way, but here I was worried about this proliferation of, of links in that, in that side uh, thing. And so, and also week one, week two, like, is that meaningful? Because for them, it's, just, it's a date, it's not a week. And, and so it was just kind of, you know, I wasn't really sure how exactly um, to sort that out. Um, I know Jamie in her course actually did, did this, and that's something we had talked about. We health, uh, so she's got week one, week two, week three, week four in here. And, but then fixed it by putting in the actual the term of what that thing is. And so I would recommend that way that these, um, for some reason, that people don't want to do that second click. And in some ways, I don't blame them. And I think probably big corporations know that they shouldn't do that um, in their websites anyway. So that's, so that's something there is like how do people sort of find their way in in the first place and, and what is it that you're doing? Are you going to listen to a lecture? Are you going to do an assignment? Is it a, I mean, what's the nature of a week when it's not like show up to class and then I tell you everything what to do in some way? So then there's flows through the material where I get the comment like, hey, I thought this was an online class. Like, why can't I watch the stuff from week eight now? And so the class for me that are... are the way I've, I've structured this thing is I've tried to make each week sort of conceptually independent. And so it's not cumulative, like you don't learn something in week one that you add to week two, week three. So I'm saying, hey, let's look at what psychologists think. Hey, let's look at what social psychologists think. Let's look at technologists. And then at the end, we'll put them all together. And so focus in here, then focus in here. And in the end, we build this, this uh, framework that says, okay, you draw the picture, and if it's this one that is the most binding, then let's go back to that, and then we can understand how that is creating the problem of innovation that we have. And so it's sort of like a, a, a Venn diagram like this. But what I want to do is handle each one of those separately to not create confusion. Because my whole proposition is that there's complete, it's, it's very confusing because of how we do it. And so let me just try doing it a different way. Well, so I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, week one, lecture, quiz, assignment, discussions, week two, week three, week four, and that we'd go through that way. Well, it turns out that people did not want to do that. Someone said, I want to watch all the lectures. And so then I open up all the lectures. And people say, I don't know where we are anymore. I'm all con totally confused. I can't figure out where we are. Um, I want to take all the quizzes. Same thing. Like, oh, I don't know which quiz we took. I don't know uh, what's going on there. Um, so some people will, will fix it this way. And so this is literally the syllabus, week one, week two, week three. This is not my syllabus. This is someone else and, and really has, has put all this stuff on one page so that people can go to one page and say, okay, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I do this? And that's worth thinking about. I don't know what the right answer is, but it really is a sense of, of where you are. Um, I feel like we weren't in the super early days of Coursera, but certainly from March 5th to when we ended, both Doug and I uh, sort of taught at the same time, there were days the platform would change every day. You go in and, and you used to clicking this button, it's like, where'd the button go? It's like it went somewhere else. And, and so they were developing as we were, as we were going through this, and I think that may have affected the, some of the students' uh, perception as well. So what, th what it turned out is what it seemed like is that people wanted to be able to sort of do this alternative flow through it. It's like, well, that made no sense to me. <laughs> and I had trouble explaining to them why that shouldn't make sense to them. <laughs> right? But, they, but that's, what they, that's how they wanted to go through it. And in some ways, they're, they're right, right? Is this student-centric or am I being class-centric? Well, uh, um, Coursera has this sort of cohort model, right, where the class has a starting date and then we sort of march through. And it's not something that's up all the time and you just sort of come in and go out whenever you want. I was trying to use that because of these discussions. And let me just uh, pop to that so people were bouncing around. This was the main thing uh, that was important for me. So what I did was each week I had a topic, uh, basically a question, a discussion question that everyone had to comment on, and you were graded based on commenting on that. They didn't like that either because there were too many, over 52,000 people. They thought it was going to be uh, pandemonium. But they dis the discussions um, were based on that week's topic. And so when people went over here, they'd read stuff here, and they'd try to bring it into discussion here where it was not really relevant and created confusion among people who were actually following the things as they went along. And so there's something there. I'm just not really sure how to honor people's willingness or, or ability to, to, like, I already know this. Let me jump ahead in the material. Let me move ahead and not create confusion with other people and also um, confuse themselves. Yeah, innovation. I know about innovation. It's like, why are you taking the class? 
I mean, because I'm trying to explain a way of going through it, but the word is so common that, that people are, are used to it that way. The next thing, um, so here uh, each week was one that was based on that level. So constraints in groups, individuals, and organizations, and industry sectors. So I was trying to keep them separated. Here's where all the action was in the class. This is where I, I that, this made it worth it. I videotaped my whole thing and I did, I did it again. I had to videotape it again because stupidly I, I, I recorded in the wrong format and it just didn't work and blah, blah, blah. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, that was my, more of my uh, idiocy. Uh, but it, it came out better in the end, so, so it was uh, uh, worth it. Um, so let me just talk about discussion forms. So my quote for the discussion, discussion forms is there are infinite need. If you go in there at any time, big class like this, it'll say 40 seconds ago, someone just posted. <laughs> You go 4 a.m., 40 seconds ago, someone just posted, right? Because there's people all around the globe, and they're all in there. There is infinite need. And so I had to basically just say, okay, I'm going to do two hours and then stop. And whatever I come in, wherever I am at two hours when I start in, and then I'll work for two hours and I'll stop. And, and I just had to be kind of almost random in a way. My TA probably put in about four or five hours a day. Um, just infinite need. <laughs> One problem with the forms, well, there are too many uh, default forms, so when we go in to set up, and, it, and you sort of think that they know what they were doing before, because that's why they call them the defaults, but there's, it's kind of, it was kind of a mess. Um, there are all kinds of, uh, probably about 10 of these are, are default forums, and the problem is, uh, let me just g give an example. Um, uh, problem is that uh, it would say lectures, specific questions about the lectures, and so those would pile up because there would be week one lecture, week two lecture, week three lecture, week four lecture, they'd start to pile up and then people would upvote something from week one but we're in week five and so that appears at the top when someone comes in and they're confused about it. Um, same with technical feedback, technical problems, that sort of got jumbled into some of the other um, uh, places as well. And so for me going forward is really to stop and think about, okay, what do, they, what do we need to have conversations about? The um, weekly discussion post for me, that's the most important thing. Uh, comment, content, comments, questions, that's almost really a, a part of this, and then technical problems. The other thing with technical problems, if it's just a, a, a catch-all that goes through the whole eight weeks, um, people will not have the problem, but they'll think they have the problem just because they saw someone else had mentioned it. And so then it, and so you want those things to go away. Once they're fixed, you want those, the, the even all any references to them, sort of like the NSA or something like that. So make the stuff go away. Um, <laughs> Things that need to be there all the whole time, team member, group, uh, study groups, and final project posting. So I had them do a project. They had to big videotape their project and put it up. The last thing, um, yeah, so and each week I had a thing here that said submit a post. If they had an issue, a problem, or whatever, they'd submit a post and it'd go into that week's post. And that's something only learned by actually doing the thing uh, in that way. Then I had this other problem of the course tracks. This is what I actually wanted. What we ended up being able to do was only a standard track and a distinction track, and that's a Coursera policy issue. It was not, not, nothing else besides that. Um, so I, you're going to feel guilty if you go watch, take the class and don't uh, do the videos, but that's how they, um, they want to do that. And so I had to keep distinguishing between the standard track, which was a set of watch the video, take the quizzes, and then a group project track. And it created a lot of confusion because people didn't know which track they were in. I'm like, well, which track do you want to be in? They just, you know. Because, of course, there's no way to so assert it up front because the, this distinction is made with uh, basically with the, with the grade point. Um, so if you're doing really well, then you end up in the distinction track. And so they would ask, am I in the distinction track? But the way I was using it was actually, I had sort of two different algorithms. If you did the project stuff, that grade climbed up. If you did the individual stuff, that grade climbed up. But people couldn't see what their grade was. And so and then that, I think that's, I'm not sure if that's fixed or not, but um, it's not, still can't really tell where you are. Um, and so there, I tried a bunch of different ways. So at first I said students in both tracks, st only students in student mastery track. Um, uh, uh, so this was really confusing. Then I tried this thing. This is an eight-week course, and I was trying every, I was every single way. Um, stu all students, students also complete this. That didn't work. Um, <laughs> Then I, this is where I ended up, where it is basically the weekly overview, learning activity, lectures, reading, and then part two, all students do this, studio mastery track only. And somehow that seemed to take and that seemed to work. Um, but by that point, I think people started understanding how my brain worked and how that um, how went. Uh, let's see what else I want to say. So the, where else am I here? Um, I, I think the, I guess in, in, in summary, I'm going to uh, stop here. The, um, 
I just had all these assumptions that I just, I thought everyone would see how, any idiot would see like I, that you click this here if you want this to happen. And I really realized that um, there, are a lot, there are lots of idiots out there. <laughs> and that I was being an idiot also because I just maybe, maybe assumed that. And we had probably, we had more people non-US than US. We had more, we had lots of college graduates, but people who really um, just had taken a different course and they assumed that's how you do it in the Coursera course. Then when they take your course, they're not able to sort of tool over their brain to say, okay, he's doing it differently because this is not cumulative content or, or for, for some other reason like that. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone uh, uh, about this, also to give you lots of horror stories about not what format not to record your video in. Um, <laughs> and I think, uh, let me just turn it over to Doug, are you next? And I can answer a question or two while he's... Uh, as, as a platform, Coursera versus Blackboard, you mentioned Blackboard, since yeah. you have experience, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, Coursera, you can do anything, you just have to know how to do it. And so you can write code, you can stick JavaScript in there, you can do all lots of things. And so once I got, he has a computer scientist, he's got a, uh, a um, TA who is really, uh, um, really, really good programmer. And so he taught me lots of things like that. Um, it's very, very powerful. Where at Blackboard, you just sort of, you know, you're locked into the way it's, it's structured. And this one, you could just do anything. You can show videos anywhere you want in the thing. You can, um, but it's overwhelming for a non technical person. So if you're not a computer scientist at first, you will feel overwhelmed. Totally, yeah. Yes? Is, is there a technical all my videos were captioned and they were, um, I'll keep shouting, they were all captioned, they, Coursera captions them and they, um, as far as technical support, they had, uh, I think they could, they could, they could, um, they could contact Coursera but they did, they, it was my fault. It wasn't Coursera's fault, it was my fault because it was my course and so I had to, so, so from their perspective, I needed to fix it. And so I'm the one who had to sort of broker to Coursera more than them. The one thing that would, I think that would go a million miles is a small, short video on here's how a course works in Coursera, here's how you click this, here's how you do peer assessments, huge confusion. Um, because there's th these different phases, and you're not sure what the phases mean. There's a submission phase, evaluation phase, assessment phase, and then which phase are you in? And then there's a the yellow box that shows up, and then there's a green box, and, and it's not really clear what it is. To the Coursera people, you know, all these PhDs at Stanford, in computer science, <laughs> makes perfect sense. Uh, but you have, you know, you have a, a person who's in Pakistan who's doing this over a 2400 baud connection who doesn't have, you know, access to that, but who wants to take the course. Um, it doesn't make sense to that. So, yeah. Anyway, so thanks very much. Thank you. So uh, I'm Doug Schmidt, and you'll notice that Jamie, David, and I have all mastered the art of talking in 15 to 20 minute chunks. <laughs> and uh, I will try to keep with the same trend. So I was going to talk a little bit about my experiences with Coursera. Some of this will be uh, reminiscent of what you heard. I'll try to give you a little different take on a few things. I taught a course that was about software design and programming for concurrent and networked software systems. So it was more computer science-y, more software related than some of the stuff that we've just talked about. Uh, this course was an amalgamation of several of the classes I teach here at Vanderbilt. It's not any particular class though, and that was somewhat intentional for a couple different reasons, but the long and the short of it is that you couldn't take the course that I have online and, and get college credit, expect to get college credit for what we're doing here at Vanderbilt. One of the things I did, because of the, of the way I recorded the videos, was that I ended up having all the videos done in time for my course I was teaching face-to-face -face here at Vanderbilt last spring. And so we actually used some of the material in the class, not so much in a flipped classroom model, but more as an augmentation. If students happened to zone out during one of my lectures, or they missed the lecture, or they wanted to get additional clarification, they could go and watch the Coursera videos and get additional information. They could watch it multiple times, they could speed it up, they could slow it down, and I think that helped them get a deeper understanding of the material. So a couple quick factoids. I've created about 1,200 slides for the class. It was an eight-week course. Uh, about 20 hours worth of video that we finally finished. We shot for about two months, seemed pretty much all the time at the time. Uh, 85 videos, had about 31,000 people when the course started, and I think my experience was much like everybody else's. It starts out with this large number, and by the time you get the people who graduate at the end, it's 5% of the total amount get a certificate of some kind, but a lot more people lurk and watch the videos. I've actually kept my website open after the course was done. It ended about a month and a half ago, and people still come along and watch the videos and actually post to the discussion boards now and again. Uh, I had about 8,000 postings on the discussion board, which was roughly maybe 10% 
of what David and Julie had. The main difference was I tried to actually answer every single post on the discussion board. <laughs> so there was indeed, <laughs> indeed infinite need. <laughs> At the time, I was really struck by the fact it would take me hundreds and hundreds of years to teach this many students if I were to teach it at the rate of the courses I teach here at Vanderbilt. I, I average about 30 students per semester in the course I teach here. So it would take a long time to reach that number. Uh, it was also a group effort. I think this really needs to be underscored. It's not something I could have done on my own. David did an awful lot on his own, but uh, I think we all discovered that you needed to get that help, especially for things where you just didn't want to have to be the expert. Uh, and so I was very fortunate. In fact, it's kind of funny to be in a room with John and Jeff and Michael and not have it look like a dungeon. Because <laughs> an awful lot of the filming, you're kind of staring in this little camera and it's, it's somewhat, uh, uh, I don't know, a little bit dehumanizing in a way. Here's the heat map that we had from the course. If you take a look, you can see we had representation like the other courses from almost everywhere around the world. I think uh, what, one of the things that really struck with me was the density of interest in Europe. I think every single person in Luxembourg was signed up for my course <laughs> at some point along the way. Not, not much. Um, surprisingly low participation from China, which is unusual because I would have thought there was tremendous interest there. I think the language barrier is one of the main things that made that tough. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. It, oh, that's, that's true. And there were also issues. People in China couldn't uh, get to the YouTube discussion group and so on. So here are a few observations based on what, we've, what I learned from doing this. First, going back to the Coursera platform issues. So the platform is fairly easy to learn. It's very scalable. It's fantastic. You can get video disseminated all around the world very easily. Uh, it's very, very tedious to use. Uh, it may have been designed by computer scientists, but I think that they were people in, in the 101 course learning. At, you know, so they're very, the usability factor is low. Uh, one of the big problems, there's really no easy way for students to get a bird's eye view of all the things they have on the hook uh, to do, and they can't tell what they're doing in the course as far as how well they're performing. That's still an open issue. Cynthia and I had a conversation just the other day with some of the Coursera technical people, and that still remains a problem. <coughs> One of the things that we learned was when people would complain, uh, which they did quite frequently, <laughs> we would point them to the technical support page portal that Coursera has. And rather than being mad at us, we would say, go tell them what your needs are. And maybe if enough people voice their needs, they'll get fixed. And, and they did, actually, in quite many cases. Uh, it, it was also hard to scale things up. We went really off the deep end with respect to peer assessment. Uh, we also went off the deep end in terms of having many, many programming languages and frameworks for each assignment. So we had four programming assignments in the course. Each programming assignment, we let people program about a dozen different languages, which was quite fascinating. Uh, and that was done through peer assessment. And one of the things that quickly became unwieldy was that just the number of variations in, the, message, in the, um, the online course forum to try to keep track of this stuff. It was very unwieldy. A lot of the prop popular platforms you might think would be supported weren't supported. So no support for Android, no support for iPhone or iPad. Some of the common browsers aren't supported. If you use Chrome, it generally works. If you use IE, it generally works. If you use Firefox, it generally works. But that was some things that were a little quirky. One of the things we discovered was many, many people weren't actually using the browser at all, for the most part. They were downloading the videos and watching them on their phones. But that has some other interesting consequences with respect to things like taking embedded quizzes. One problem that I think is now pretty much fixed, but was a real issue in the time frame we taught my course, was the fact that they, wouldn't, they didn't have a way to be able to edit the translations. So they would transcribe our speaking into English subtitles, but they would often be wildly inaccurate, and there was no way to fix that. And that confused the heck out of the non-native speakers, because they, they couldn't understand what we were talking about half the time. So then things about students. One of the things I thought quite fascinating about this, very, very interactive. When I teach classes here at Vanderbilt, I've got students whose SAT scores are asymptotically approaching perfection. These are bright, bright people. But I have to tell you, when I ask questions in class, pretty much the same three or four people raise their hand every time and pretty much participate. And the rest of them just sort of sit there and look at me. And they seem to do well, and they seem to learn from the class. But there's very little true engagement in any deep sense. And there's all kinds of reasons for that, perhaps. Not so in the Coursera environment. People have an opinion about everything. They will never hesitate to be shy to tell you about what you could be doing to improve your course. <laughs> Which, which was a little annoying at first, but I then discovered very quickly that they were giving back to me incredibly valuable insight that I never get from my normal students. And so I've actually become a much better professor. My material is better. 
the courses I'll teach in Coursera and face-to-face -face are much improved because someone actually took the time to give me critical feedback that the students here often don't. One of the things we also did, I think we were sort of the forerunners here, was this concept of virtual office hours using Google Hangout and YouTube. And that made it almost like a real class. Not quite, but almost. So every week we would have uh, at least an hour where I would sit there and, and broadcast to the world. And there'd usually be 100 or so people logged in, interacting with me in real time and asking questions. And I would go over some material that had come up in the message boards or from the assignment. Then they would ask questions. I would give my responses. And all that would be transcribed and automatically archived by Google. And then I would upload it to the Coursera website. And people could come and watch that. And in many cases, people have watched that video, those videos, which are incredibly low quality uh, webcam-like videos, as much as they've watched some of the videos from the actual course, where we spent a lot of time actually putting work into the production. So that's a way to get things much more interactive, much more real time, very valuable. Uh, I'm sure as my fellow uh, teachers can attest, patience is a virtue. <laughs> it does you absolutely no good to get pissed off at the people who are pestering you with the questions. It, it just doesn't help. Uh, for those of you who grew up with Gomer Pyle, there's a great Gomer Pyle episode where Gomer bets Sergeant Carter he can't get through the day without screaming at someone. And at the end of the episode, the sergeant drives off to some remote place and, and just screams for half an hour just to get it out of his system. I felt that like that a lot of times. But you have to make sure that this, the class never sees you break your stride. <laughs> Another thing that's interesting, students, much, much more than we see here at Vanderbilt, tend to be very wedded to their positions. Uh, and I'll talk more in a second about why I think that is. Uh, people who were working, say, in writing application software for in COBOL in India think that that's all people do. People who are writing smartphone apps and iPhone think that's all anybody does. And so people were very, very wedded to their particular piece of the elephant. And what was important to them was they thought the only thing that mattered. And one of the things that I've really found from the virtual office hours and the discussion boards was trying to help broaden people's perspective. I spent, that's one of the reasons I spent so much time on those boards, was to help them see that what they thought wasn't wrong, it just wasn't all there was to understand the space. I think that there's a lot of value in that. And that's one of the things I think that comes from having a global learning community, is people learning from each other to see the breadth of the experience. With respect to online discussion forums, a uh, very, very valuable resource. In my mind, they transform the course from being lecture-oriented, a la a classic lecture hall in a you know, three or 400 person auditorium in a big state university, to something that's more learning-oriented, where people are really learning. And that's what they got out of the discussion forums. Watching the lectures was useful, but learning really took place in the form. You could watch it evolve as you were monitoring the discussions. Uh, I really viewed the forum as a way to help uh, dispel common misperceptions that people had. There was a lot of misperceptions in our community about software, how you build software, what languages you use, what tools you use, and so on. And helping people get beyond the, the stereotypes is very, very important. I also found that a lot of the students, because I was so active and my TA was so active, actually began to give back. They helped with a lot of the crowdsourcing of the quality of the course, finding little glitches with typos or missing links or other things that we never would have been able to find on our own, finding them, helping to fix them, and, and doing other kind of interesting stuff. And also getting them to be constructive and not destructive in their conversations and, and discussions. The other thing that we got, I think David mentioned this too, we, we got a lot of things we did in the course because of the feedback we got from the students. So students said, release the videos before the weekend so we can watch them when we have our off times. That made a lot of sense. Uh, have late days for students who occasionally can't make a quiz because they have work. Eventually, we finally said, we're just going to move all the quiz deadlines to the end of the course. So as long as you finish them by the time you're done, that's fine with us. You know, you take it at your own pace. Uh, we had support for multiple programming languages for all our assignments, which was absolutely fascinating. I would never, ever try to teach a course like that face-to-face, -face, where each assignment had 12 different programming languages or frameworks. And yet, with peer assessment, we could have people who would be groups of experts that were interested in their language or framework working together to evaluate each other's work. So that was kind of novel. Crowdsourcing material, people uh, used the wiki forum to basically go through what Jamie mentioned, extracting all the URLs out of our slides. They did that on their own. They posted that. They maintained that. They came up with a glossary of all the course terms. They you know, basically maintained those kinds of things. It was really helpful to get the people to give back in that way. One interesting observation, however, uh, even though there were lots of people reading the message boards, nobody seemed to read things in any particular order. So they would ask the same question again and again and again. 
And finally, I just sort of memorized, I would just use the search facility to memorize where things were so I could just cut and paste the links and get people to go find them over again. This, the discussions were generally very civil. That's one reason why I tried to be so engaged. I, I find in general, if, if you stay engaged, then students are happy. If you get too far removed, they start to feel like they're not being, having their needs attended to and they get gripey and stuff like that. Uh, and being flexible was very important as well. OK, a couple other things and I'll wrap up. Design, Design-oriented courses like my course are much harder to do by a MOOC. Uh, a fact-oriented MOOC is much more suitable for the kinds of things where you're doing things with multiple choice or, or other kind of stuff you could automatically grade. I think in some sense that is important for us in face-to-face -face courses. We should be teaching things that hard, are hard to replace with MOOCs because otherwise uh, we, we lower our value proposition. I had some short essay questions. People said, we're here to learn programming. We don't want to talk about our experiences. So that we got rid of that pretty fast. Crowdsourcing was important. A lot of problems with plagiarism, surprisingly. I mean, this isn't really a real course, but people were copying and cheating, just like they do in real life. Um, enormous amount of interest in the grading policy. I thought initially, this is monopoly money. This isn't real. People took it very seriously, and they were absolutely obsessed about that all the way to the end of the class, which I had to quickly adapt my perspective. The reason why I had to adapt my perspective is some of this stuff really meant something to them. It was monopoly money to people who are accustomed to Vandy students, but for people who are in Bangladesh or some other place, having a statement of accomplishment from this kind of a course is their way to get further up the queue in get, trying to get that job at the call center. So it really is real, it's real value to them. A lot of differences. Prerequisites were a real issue. People were all over the place in terms of preparation. I anticipated that and filmed some introductory material. The advanced students were bored out of their mind. The beginning students couldn't have done what they did without having that material. Looking forward, I think I will redo my course to have some optional material they can watch at the beginning that probably won't be graded, just so people can come up to speed in their own terms. Uh, another fascinating phenomenon that I noticed, if I look at my average 18 to 22 year old Vandy student, for them to have 20 plus years of experience in software means that they are a Mozart level prodigy, right? <laughs> In the, the MOOC world, I had lots of people, the most interesting and, and voracious posters and responders and, and so on on the, on the message boards were people with 20 to 30 years of experience. And you don't normally face that as a professor. So I had to spend an awful lot of time trying to help them understand how to get into learning mode, which I never deal with in my normal classes. You start from day one, they're receiving. In this case, you have to spend a lot of time explaining that you know, using language X is, doesn't mean that everything else is bad, or using a particular tool doesn't mean you don't like something else. There's a lot of people with very passionate feelings about technology. And there's other things I won't bore you with about the technical issues of software design, where people have different areas. And I think Jamie talked about uh, you know, nutrition being more than just a science. It's a, it's a uh, belief system. And the same thing is true also about software. <coughs> Doing things in a static nature with the videos was hard. In a normal course, you can jump around a bit in the lectures and get people's questions answered quickly. Um, you can't really do that except through the message boards and the discussion forum and so on and the virtual office hours. So that was hard. Uh, it, if people really need to demand, people want to demand answers. And so that's one reason why the message boards were so overflowing. People would get confused because it wasn't quite presented in the way that they could relate to. And that made it hard for them. So we had a lot of discussion taking place there. OK, so to wrap up, I, I think that something absolutely fascinating is taking place. And I feel very fortunate, very blessed to have been part of this. I think we all share that experience here. Um, there's a triple convergence that Thomas Friedman talks about with respect to technology, like the internet, business processes, and the global workforce. And, and MOOCs and digital learning are squarely in the heart of that. As a general rule, it's better to be surfing this wave than left behind or crushed by it. So I think what we're doing here is very smart. Um, digital learning is transforming a lot of things. We at Vanderbilt are not the leaders in this, but we're fast followers. And that's probably not a bad position to be because a lot of leaders are going to blow through a lot of venture capital before they figure out what actually works or not. And I think we're well positioned here. Thomas Friedman also has a great quote about big breakthroughs happening when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. And there certainly seems to be a perception that uh, helping to improve the value proposition of education is very important globally. And finally, if you're interested, I have an uh, article that appeared in Vanderbilt Magazine last issue, which is still out on the web, that tries to summarize some of what I've told you here in a written way, which you might want to take a look at as well. And that one, we turn it over to Doug.
So I'm the only one today that has not made a MOOC. And um, this is actually, I think, something that we have to um, think about because many of us are not going to be making MOOCs. Um, but we're still going to be using the resources that other people produce, the online resources that, are, that other people produce. And I'm here to tell you that using other people's material and other people's MOOCs for courses is an intellectually satisfying thing to do. And it is um, uh, good for students as well. Many of you are familiar, most of you are familiar with the flipped model. Um, I'm just going to talk about my experience using um, MOOCs and other online resources. I used them in several classes. One class I used them in was in our database class. And I would have students uh, read the textbook and watch lectures by Jennifer Whiteham, who's a well-known uh, computer scientist at Stanford, her videos on databases. And we also adapted her, um, her textbook. Um, for the course. But they would watch the videos. They would walk into class uh, for the first class meeting of the week, and they would take a quiz on the reading and the videos that were covered. Um, they would then, in the context of the plenary class meeting, they would do what is called active learning. Um, and I would design some active learning exercises for them to do. In one such um, uh, class after watching um, uh, videos on relational databases, and I won't play these videos for you, although I was going to, they would walk into class and they would receive a, a list of exercises to do. They would break into small groups of four or five, and they would go to different parts of the room, or they might even go to separate rooms. In this particular example, they would watch an outstanding video by Hans Rosling on visualizing data of world health and wealth um, changes over a span of 200 years. Um, it's a nice video, very engaging, very, very entertaining. And then they would more or less spend the class time reverse engineering the database that they thought was necessary to support that visualization. And, you know, for an instructor, this is an example where you really, you, the class got loud. Every small group was interacting. It was um, a very high volume, and it, um, it actually, as an instructor, felt great because you knew that they were engaged. And I would walk around, and I would answer questions about that each group would have about the database that they were designing. So a good example of um, uh, um, active learning. Uh, if, I look at the, if we look at the uh, evaluations that I had before and after, before I started using these active learning techniques, and after... I started using these active learning techniques. Um, we compare the um, course evaluations. We have a, you know, a standard course evaluation at Vanderbilt where we have students fill out you know, how available was the instructor outside of class, how important uh, was this course for your, uh, your development. There are a couple of ratings which are sort of holistic ratings, one for the instructor, one for the course. And suffice to say that my ratings as an instructor never went down, and in almost all cases, they went up. Um, and those were my ratings for an instructor, even though I was using other material by other professors. The course ratings went up um, uh, across the board as well. And you'll see that I used these for a couple different offerings. I used uh, MOOC material for a couple different offerings of database couple different offerings of machine learning, one offering of artificial intelligence where I would actually have them go out and watch the uh, uh, video lectures by uh, other faculty. In all cases, the instructor rating went up. These are on a five-point scale, by the way, and the standard deviations went down. And I think that's as equally important that those standard deviations went down in terms of student satisfaction. Um, I just point up a, a couple of things here. One, in using this material, I was very conscious about terms of service uh, and using the material in a way that uh, was allowed. At one point in one of the, um, um, and I was, I was doing this since the first time I started doing this was right after Stanford announced its um, um, MOOCs in, in fall 2011, and I started using that same material the next uh, the next semester because two of those courses were machine learning and database and the very following semester I was teaching machine learning and database and um, at that point 
it was even before Coursera's founding, but um, it was um, the Stanford videos were up. There was no terms of service. They were just there. You just went in and tell your students to watch them, and so we used them. At some point in a machine learning course, um, uh, one of these machine learning courses, the uh, second one, um, we discovered that the terms of service said that you cannot use material from this MOOC in a for tuition class. I think I'm roughly paraphrasing the requirements uh, appropriately. Unless you get explicit written permission. So we got the explicit written permission. And so we were consistent with the terms of service. Terms of service have yet changed again. And the important thing about those changing terms of service, typically it's not the instructor who's requiring that students turn in the material that's going to be in violation. It's the students who are in violation for turning in the material. Uh, and so we as instructors have to be very conscious about those terms of service unless we want to put our uh, students in, um, um, you know, not in jeopardy per se, but, um, uh, you know, violating terms of service. Um, as a good academic, I think, when I started using the material by other people, I started producing my own material. I felt the obligation to give back. Um, and I started putting up video material on lectures that weren't well covered in those courses that I was, I was teaching. In the AI course, I produced uh, some videos that I posted to YouTube. These were simple voiceover PowerPoint videos. Um, uh, posted them to YouTube and had my students start watching them within a very short period of time, like within a week or two. I started getting students coming from elsewhere looking at my videos and commenting. And a lot of these students were coming from a UC Berkeley MOOC in artificial intelligence. And they were coming to my videos for clarification on topics. And they were leaving posts. I went to the, you know, the videos um, or the, um, uh, the platform's uh, site where these, uh, this MOOC was being hosted and confirmed that the students had taken it back, posted the discussion board. Fisher's got these great videos explaining this that are not so well explained in our course. Go check them out. Um, so for the first time, you know, I have followers. I have never had followers before. <laughs> these, I'm sure I've broken 20,000 by now, but, you know, these numbers are small by MOOC standards, but they are a very big deal for me. Um, and I think I appeal to those students. My material appeals to those students that, um, um, that aren't somehow you know, getting what the, uh, the MOOC um, uh, presenters are, are giving, but they, I would guess, like very grounded kind of examples. Because those are, when I do a nuts and bolts lecture, I give very grounded examples. And in fact, you know, I think for courses like this, um, I might give, you know, three inspirational lectures in my class a year, in a semester. My first lecture in artificial intelligence is an inspirational lecture, and students come back. They leave wanting more of that. They come back, and they get a kind of, for the next few lectures or many lectures, is sort of nuts and bolts, where we're going through some algorithm, this or that. And those nuts and bolts lectures are just so much better online than what I can do in class. The inspirational lectures, I still want to give those live. They're too much fun. But the nuts and bolts stuff, uh, I want to get all that stuff online. Um, you know, we use other kinds of resources in a context like this. And um, here's the AI. Uh, when I give those lectures, I use the slides that are allowed for this kind of use uh, from the online textbook that we use. So I'm using these people's slides. They are licensed for um, der derivations, and so I can make changes to those slides, and I can use those slides for my lectures that I post to YouTube. The book itself is hard copy, is uh, published by Cambridge University Press, but it's also um, free and online. And one thing I'd like to do in the um, uh, upcoming semester, and one thing that I think uh, the Center for Teaching, Derek, and some of his people are doing is uh, we want to look at uh, some annotation tools. Uh, one is NB out of um, MIT, David Carter's uh, research group. We can actually go in and students can actually annotate 
uh, a textbook. The there is no discussion board per se in this upcoming offering that I imagine. The discussion board is the textbook. And students can sort of electronically write in the margins of the PDF and then respond to each other. I didn't understand this point. Well, this point is better raised over in this Wikipedia article, et cetera, et cetera. And so these other, there are these other digital learning, um, um, I think, tools that um, uh, we can use to augment the course. I'm interested in getting students involved in content creation themselves, as well as, again, producing my own content. And the, my own content is not just videos, but uh, I've initiated a wiki book. And the idea in this wiki book is this is intended to be a lab companion for an artificial intelligence course. Um, it is intended to be for those instructors that want to build in environmental sustainability into their AI courses. Because artificial intelligence, there's a lot of application in environmental and societal sustainability, the smart grid, etc., for artificial intelligence. And so this is going to be a collection of exercises uh, and assignments that any instructor who wants to build in a sustainability into their artificial intelligence course can go to and get ideas for. Ah, you're just looking at heuristic search. Here's a bunch of applications in sustainability that are going to be relevant for you. I started this wiki book, and within two minutes of starting it, there was somebody on there editing it. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you have control issues, do not start a wiki book. <laughs> or do start the wiki book and get over those control issues very quickly. But this is something I want to encourage students to also participate in. I'm getting really excited about the possibilities for customization and community. I think you've heard community from uh, a number of, uh, of the speakers before. In addition to Andrew Wang's course, there's going to be a, a MOOC, presumably, from University of Washington, Pedro Dominguez. Next time I teach machine learning, because I would teach it different than Andrew Wang teaches it. I would teach a different course. And I did teach a different course, even when I used his materials. I'd like to draw from those sources. I'd like to draw from machine learning component from these sources. I'd like to draw from my own content. And I would like to customize um, uh, a course using a variety of online materials. Um, people are now putting out that, um, the content that they're producing. And you've got um, places like Teaching Tree, which are archiving. Uh, this freely available online content that other people can draw from. And I think we're headed towards a, um, a day when we have uh, full-blown uh, educational social networks where um, people will vet this material online and customize it. And you'll see that there are not popular courses, but popular, cust well, yes, popular courses, but they are courses that have been customized from a variety of different authors. Um, I'm going to race through this other than to say that even back in October 2012, you could essentially take all the courses that would satisfy a computer science major at most, um, uh, uh, most universities. A couple slides to sum up. Uh, these are somewhat long slides. But things that had initially concerned me when I uh, did this was uh, fear about outsourcing my lectures. Um, what would students and Vanderbilt and other faculty in my department think about my using lectures from other people. I was worried about that. Um, I responded in a couple of different ways. One, I started creating my own content. Uh, that made me feel a lot better about using other people's content. Um, I cast the MOOC as a multimedia textbook. And I would talk about it as a multimedia textbook. And others have certainly done this too. They've talked about it as multimedia textbooks. Um, and I sort of cast that for purposes of presenting it to students and others to promote acceptance. The problem is that a MOOC is not a multimedia textbook. A good textbook is something which aspires to synthesize across a field. A good textbook is intended to support customization by different instructors at different universities. So you teach one AI course using that textbook, you teach another one, they're all different. A good textbook is going to support that. And a MOOC can be part of a larger uh, set of material that is eventually synthesized into a multimedia textbook, but it is not there now. Um, I was on a recent panel. One of the other panelists who's the director of digital learning, so to speak, at MIT said, it, I, would be a, I would be honored to be a glorified TA. This is something of a perception that we have to worry about. I've never talked about it like that, but um, um, 
I have never in some sense felt like a TA in this new environment. When, I'm walk when that class is loud and when students are working and I'm walking around, I'm actually more vulnerable than I've ever been. And if that's what you mean a TA is, that TA is the most vulnerable person in the environment because they're taking questions in real time. Well, then yes, I'm a, I'm a, a, a TA. But it's actually quite exciting. And I'm feeling like more of an instructor than I felt for a long time. Because it's, it gets old to sort of review your PowerPoint slides as you're walking off to class. Um, this is a much more dynamic environment that's a lot more exciting. Some things that are exciting me, and I'll finish up. One is, my sense is, anecdotally, is that in my classes in which I'm using this other material in active learning, I'm raising the floor. The, f the worst performing students are now performing better. The floor is getting better. As Doug pointed out, the very best students are the very best students, and they are at the ceiling, and you're not going to beat the ceiling. But the floor is being raised in that distribution which Peng Wei showed uh, earlier this morning for some of us, Daphne Kohler has, Andrew Eng, Eng has in their lectures, that's, that distribution of student performance is moving up towards the ceiling. Uh, and that's my experience. I'm getting excited about content creation, both by me and students. In my graduate classes, I require students to produce content that in principle could go out on the web that others could use, educational content. Local and global learning communities. Not only are we interested in bringing the world to Vanderbilt, but we want our students to experience the world. And to, for our students to participate in these global discussions, I think, is probably one of the most exciting things that, uh, that I can imagine. This is a point that uh, I have um, adopted from um, Derek, um, creating kind of cost-effective content sampling by students. Um, back in the day, I went to three public universities, three different majors. The university was a place to explore and find what you were interested in. Three different majors until I hit upon computer science. Students can't do that today without s taking on incredible debt. Um, but with these online materials, perhaps they can. Perhaps this is a new mechanism for students to be able to sample different content and find um, I'll uh, find that out. Is that a true two minutes, or is that, um, OK, good. <laughs> I didn't know if you were being kind or not. Um, all of these are examples, I think, of increasing bang for the buck, in cr looking for online um, uh, resources to improve the quality of education for our on-campus students. I like the idea that um, you know, we can extend lifelong learning opportunities to our alums that an alum just doesn't have a four-year experience with the university and goes away, but we can engage with these people for their lifetime uh, through online uh, 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 mechanisms. Softening boundaries between formal and informal learning. I've got another job besides the director for Vanderbilt Institute for um, Digital Learning, and that's going to be, I'm going to be one of the uh, faculty directors for the college that is being built in 21st and um, West End, Warren College. I would like nothing better than there to be a MOOC on music history, and one of my students in that hall is a music history major, and they can facilitate an in-residence dorm once a week meeting of that MOOC. They can be the facilitators. They can be the teachers of that uh, content, leveraging the MOOC, which is out there for us all to leverage. Um, lots of other things that have been mentioned, but um, uh, I think the thing I get most excited about as an instructor is this ability to customize and produce content that I can piece together and others can piece together in novel ways. And this, I think, is really moving towards this idea of a multimedia textbook. You take all these resources. The archive itself is not a textbook. It does not represent a synthesis of material. A MOOC by itself is not a textbook. But when people start, instructors such as myself and others, start synthesizing across that material and creating different trajectories through the material to create courses, I think at that point you have uh, what you would call a multimedia textbook. And this results from community. Um, I will conclude there. Thank you.